Hi, I'm Gary Klein. I'm a cognitive psychologist. And for more than 30 years, I've studied how people make difficult decisions under time pressure and uncertainty. I'm going to discuss the naturalistic decision-making approach and specifically the recognition prime decision model. But first, let me give you some background. There were classical theories of decision-making dating back to the 1950s and 60s, and the research had used undergraduate college students. The students had performed artificial tasks in controlled settings. And all this was part of rational choice theory. And theory said, in order to make good decisions, you'd gather all the necessary information, then you'd generate several options, several courses of action. And you also establish a set of evaluation criteria, and you use the criteria to evaluate each of the courses of action in order to figure out which one comes out ahead. The one with the highest score is going to win. That's your decision, and that way you can make optimal decisions. My colleagues uh, working in the area of naturalistic decision-making, we began our efforts in the 1980s. We began to question that theory because we were looking at how people made decisions in natural settings, in real-world settings under time pressure. We studied firefighters, police officers, military commanders, nurses, child welfare workers, and many others. And what we found was in these settings, there were a number of features that weren't captured in a laboratory. There was lots of time pressure, It was also high stakes. Many of these decisions were life and death decisions. You can't replicate that in a lab. They usually involve multiple players. The settings were dynamic. They kept shifting, and there was lots of complexity that had to be managed. There was also a great deal of uncertainty that had to be managed. There were organizational constraints that had to be taken into account. The goals, you didn't have well-defined goals. The goals were vague, and they were shifting. And finally, the decision makers we studied had lots of experience, and that turned out to be extremely important. Prime group that we studied was, uh, we did our initial investigations with firefighters, and my team studied expert firefighters. They had about 23 years of experience on average. We studied 26 of them. We studied not their easy decisions, but their tough ones, the the critical ones, the uh, the ones that were really challenging. These were context-rich situations, and they were dynamic. They kept changing in an average of about five changes through an incident, plus lots of time pressure. 78% of the cases, they made their decisions in less than a minute, and the consequences were real. And the first thing that, that really struck us I remember the very first interview that I ever did with a firefighter. I said, I'm here to study how you make decisions. And he looked at me and said, you know, I've been a firefighter for 16 years. I've been a captain for 12 of those years. And all that time, I don't think I've ever made a single decision. And I looked uh, startled. I said, what do you do? And he said, it's just procedures. You just follow procedures. Well, that wasn't what I wanted to hear because I was there to study decision making. So I said, can I see your procedure manual? And he said, we don't have a decision man- procedure manual. It's not written down. You just know. So now we have two puzzles. First of all, he and the others that we, we studied, they all claimed that they could generate a good option as the first one they thought of. How could you do that? And then the second puzzle, even if you could do that, how can you evaluate one option except by comparing it to the others? But we had carefully collected interview protocols, and we looked at our tra- went through our transcripts. And the answer to the first puzzle, how you can generate a good option, as the first one you think of, is that's what experience buys you. That's what 10, 15, 20 years of experience buys you. You have all these patterns you've built up, all these prototypes. When you encounter a situation, you say, I know how to handle it. And so the first one you think of is usually going to work. Second puzzle, how can you evaluate it except by comparing it to the others? And the answer is you imagine it. How will it work in this particular situation, in this context? And we call that a recognition prime decision model. It has two parts. The first part is the pattern matching part. You've got a situation and you don't know what to do. 
and you've got all these patterns. And within a few seconds, you have a pattern match. And that tells you the kinds of cues that are important, so you know what to pay attention to. It tells you what to expect, so you, you, your actions can be smooth. And if your expectancies are violated, that tells you maybe I've misidentified the situation. It tells you what kinds of goals you can pursue. And it also suggests a set of actions that are likely to be successful. So that's the pattern matching part, and it happens right away. Second part is the uh, evaluation part. And this is done by mentally simulating, by imagining the action. And you do that one action at a time, like popping a DVD into a player. So here's an action. Let me play it out in my head. Oh, it'll work. Then you're ready. You can swing into action. If it almost works, then you can modify the action. And if you can't find a way to modify it to make it successful, then you say, forget that one. Let's go on to the next one until you find one that will get the job done. Let me give you an example. The example is a miracle on the Hudson. Back in 2009, this was a, an incident where a U.S. Airways flight taking off from LaGuardia hit a flock of geese, loses power in both engines. And uh, Sullenberger, the, the captain, the decision maker here, had about three and a half minutes after he had the bird strike until he landed on the Hudson River. How did he make his decision? Well, Option A, the obvious option when in this situation, you return to the airport. And so he tells air traffic controller, vector me back to the airport. And while they're doing that, while the air traffic controller is doing that, Solenberger decides, no, that's too risky. I'm not sure I can make it back in time. He rejects that one. Option B, he's headed west. I mean, headed towards Teterboro Airport in New Jersey, um, vector me there. Maybe I can land there. And while air traffic controller is trying to do that, he realizes I'm losing altitude too quickly. I'll never make it. And that leaves him with option C, the Hudson River. That's not a preferred option. That's not something you want to do. But that was the one that he was left with. And that's the one that he, that, that he wound up implementing. That's what he did. And he landed on the Hudson and he landed safely and no one died. So that's what he was, how he made the decision. Here's how he did not make the decision. He didn't set up a matrix with the different options and evaluating them. He never even bothered to try to do that. So the key features of the RPD model, recognition prime decision model. First, it's a blend of intuition plus analysis. It's not just intuition. There's also the mental simulation part. Second, the first option that a, an experienced decision maker uh, generates is usually workable. They're not randomly generating options. Third, it's a model of satisfying. I want the first option that will work, not the best option. Fourth, I'm evaluating them by mentally simulating them, by imagining them, not by setting up a matrix. Five, I'm um, trying to improve the options as I'm doing the mental simulation rather than uh, comparing them and contrasting them. The focus of this model is on situation awareness. It's not on the courses of action. Once I know what the situation is, it's usually obvious what to do. And finally, this is a model of a decision maker primed to act, not someone waiting to complete the analyses. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, please get in touch with us.